Let's talk about our next cycle. So of the six, officially six cycles that we're doing, we'll talk about the Rankine cycle. And this is something you're probably less familiar with in your everyday life, but nevertheless is quite important to us. Um, and at least for us, generates most of our electricity. This is a very simple question. I think you'll have some of these in your PSSs when we get up to the Rankine cycle PSS. Consider a steam power plant operating on the simple ideal Rankine cycle. So you need to know what simple and ideal assumptions mean. The steam's entering the turbine at a pressure. It's condensed at another pressure. Oh, sorry, and there's a temperature at the turbine entry. Determine the thermal efficiency of the cycle. So you're not given lots of data, so there's a lot that's coming out of the assumptions that are made. So we'll, we'll talk about that. There's four processes, and similar to a Brayton cycle, so these are processes that are spatially different, so they're not done in, in, like the auto cycle in the same cylinder. They're, they're separated by space, and they're all continually happening. So they're all steady state, steady flow, open processes. In the very simplest case, each of them has one inlet and one outlet. That's certainly not true when we get to more complicated Rankine cycles, but we start with the basic, and we go. So first of all, you start with a fluid and push it through a pump. The primary purpose of the pump is to increase pressure without requiring very much work to do so. And then you'll go through a boiler where you'll add heat. Typically, you'll burn some fossil fuel uh, or similar. If it's solar thermal, you might shine concentrated light and in some way boil the working fluid. Then you'll go through a turbine whose primary objective is you lower the pressure and you get work out of the turbine. And you'll end up with something that's either superheated or a saturated mixture with quite a high quality. Turbines need quite a high quality um, of fluid to run through them. And so then you'll recondense the fluid, typically back down to a saturated liquid to restart the process. Unlike our air standard cycles, this is truly a closed process. So this isn't a, you get rid of the water when you're done and you bring in fresh water at the end. This is a closed process in the sense that the water that's traveling through stays inside the system, or certainly you would like to. I won't follow that link, but you can. And it shows where the electricity in the different states comes from. For New South Wales, it comes from steam power. Yes. Do they connect the pump and the turbine on the same shaft? No. So no, in the Brayton cycle, yes, you had a through shaft, and that was how that worked. For this, so the other thing was Brayton cycle had a back work ratio, and we calculated the back work ratio for our sample, I think at 30 or 40 or 50%. So for the Brayton cycle, you put a, a large proportion of your electricity, or your power generated in your turbine, back into the compressor. We'll find for this, the ratio of pump work to turbine work might be 1%, 2%. So it's not unreasonable to take the turbine, turn it into electricity, and use electricity to run the pump. And that's you find that, that's what they do. That's a good question. Um, these are also much bit larger um, devices we find in practice. You know, a, a gas turbine engine, you would fit quite comfortably on this desk, you know, something that would work. A steam power plant, you would find wouldn't fit in the room. You know, these are larger devices. Uh, we can use inexpensive fuels, coal, obviously, but um, you can gas fire them. You can use mixed modes. So when I was in WA, they were clearing a bunch of trees to upgrade the coalfields highway, and we just threw some of the wood from the trees in with our coal into our, um, our burner. We could get up to a certain proportion, and it wouldn't cause any problems. Uh, Nuclear energy, so for our purposes, nuclear is a source of heat, uh, and can you can boil water with that heat. Concentrated solar, I mentioned as well. Large installations, base load power, slow, slow to start up, slow to, slow to shut down. Um, the reasons that you do not want to use steam power is environmental, particularly like you've heard of brown coal power plants and so forth. Uh, you end up putting a lot of heat into the environment. So you either find a lake nearby and you pump heat into the lake. Uh, you can only do that for so long before the, it starts to affect the temperature and the, the sea life. Encourages the wrong type of 
um, organisms to grow, or you have a cooling tower. And the way a cooling tower works, you got, I'm not, like Simpsons came out when I was seven, I think they started televising. But you guys all saw Simpsons. You know what I'm talking about, all right? Cool. You've got a nuclear power plant, and you've got, you know, ostensibly smoke coming out of it. I'm so old. Um, right, you've got, you've got this, this stuff rising up, okay? First of all, we can agree that it's steam and not smoke, because a nuclear power plant shouldn't be burning any fuels, okay? Cooling towers generally, in terms of how they work, right, you get a hot liquid, you get hot water, and you spray it in the top, okay? And you want to spray it into little tiny water droplets with lots of surface area to volume ratio, okay? And then, because it's hot, and because it's in small droplets, it will evaporate into the air, okay? Now, air that's moist has a lower density than air that's uh, dry, because H2O is a lighter molecule than O2. Yes, yeah, two, two hydrogens and an oxygen is lighter than two oxygens or two nitrogens, okay? And so your prevailing motion is upwards, okay? So your lighter air wants to travel up and that pushes it up against the, the falling droplets. So your liquid droplets are coming down and your moist air is going up, okay? Eventually, you have a little lake at the bottom and you need some holes inside to let the air come through, okay? And you've got like a, a, just a shallow lake at the bottom. So as your liquid water droplets join the lake, now they've had evaporation go past them and so now they're colder than they were when you sprayed them in. Okay, so that which remains as liquid water is cold and that which passes off as steam, and you can see it in the atmosphere because then it recondenses back to water droplets as it rises out of this hot, moist environment, um, that takes the heat away. So that's a cooling tower, and so you'll typically find that uh, associated with the thermal process. The water that you're doing this with isn't the same water that you're passing through your cycle. In fact, I think, Right, so here's a diagram from Reisel showing, okay, you can see you've got your boiler here, your turbine, your condenser, and your pump, right? That's a closed cycle. And then you've got an alternate cycle off to the right-hand side with a pump passing into the condenser, which is now a heat exchanger. So we can, we can analyze heat exchangers. We know how to do that. Passes water, that, then the warm water comes out gets sprayed into the cooling tower, okay? Here's the lake of water at the bottom, lake of water at the bottom of the cooling tower, which is then pumped out. And so you've got a cooling tower circuit giving you some water, and then you've got your circuit generating your power. And what's the reason you would do this? Keep it clean, Keep it clean is a good do you want to give any more detail on that? Because uh, well, you know, the open air could get all sorts of like dissolved carbon dioxide. Yep. Well done. So this water here, whoop, this water here is very pure water. Okay, that's, you want that to be H2O, essentially, right? This water here, I'm going to write tap. In industry, we call it potable as in you could put it in a pot and make food with it, like boil it for food, you know? Um, so the right-hand side, you run on potable water, so you just have, or you, can, or you can have it as salt water. If you've got, meh, that's just gonna chew out various things. If you had access to salt water, you'd do things differently. You wouldn't use a cooling tower. But you just run your cooling tower, and you'd have makeup water coming from your municipal, like, water supply. Actually, in, in Worsley, we didn't even treat it. So we didn't put fluoride in it or chlorine or whatever. We just got water from a dam and um, used that as our makeup water. Cool. Just wanted to mention that. It's an important, it's not ranking cycle related, but it's an important part of how real devices work. So pure water is used as the working fluid. That would be a typical thing. You can also run it on refrigerants. We've mentioned that before. If your uh, heat source can't get you up to high temperatures. 
the flow is provided by the pump, so the pump is forcing the whole process. And we'll find the pump uses very little electricity, uh, which is excellent. And then there's a pressure difference maintained by the turbine. We'll say external combustion uses a heat source. It may not be combustion, but you certainly don't use combustion inside the process, like you do with an auto cycle or a Brayton. So we were combusting the air we were working with. Here, we're not using air. We're using a, um, a pure substance. The turbine's producing work. That's driving a generator. Heat's added in the, in the boiler and heat's removed in the condenser. So they're our main work and heat processes. You're also putting a little bit of work into the pump as well. All the devices, steady state open flow. Steady state, yeah, open devices. The system is actually closed. It's not modeled as a closed system. It's actually closed. We've talked about pure water and potable water. Let me just scratch that out. Let's talk about the Rankine cycle. We'll find that we could draw a line through the process here, okay, and say this is high pressure and this is low pressure. Right? So the pump creates pressure and, well, pumps create flow and back, the resistance to flow creates pressure, which is a fluid mechanics thing. But So the pump is producing flow and so you've got high pressure on that side. The turbine is producing a pressure drop, so you've got a low pressure. So in the ideal case, you say that everything on the left-hand side is at a certain pressure, everything at the right-hand side is a certain pressure. And you would hope that everything is isentropic, ideally. In reality, it won't be. If you're given an efficiency, you need to use it. We've just talked about how to use that. And your work net will be the work you put in, get out of the turbine minus the work you have to put into the pump. Or you can do work net on a heat basis because work net equals Q net. So it'll be the work put, uh, heat put into the boiler or steam generator minus the heat is lost in the condenser. So you want to put as much heat into the boiler proportionally as you can and, and lose as little heat in the condenser as you can. Um, in reality, you must lose some heat in the condenser because of the turbine restrictions and so forth. If you're told it's a standard Rankine cycle, what assumptions are you made? No pressure loss through the boiler and condenser, so you've just got the two pressures to deal with. Condenser outlet is a saturated liquid. So it's not drawn so here, but I sometimes draw condensers with an inlet and an outlet and a liquid water line. So if you have some sort of large tank and you keep the top as being vapor, and you have the bottom having some fluid in it, some liquid in it, then you know that as it's leaving, it's a saturated liquid. If it was any more condensed than a saturated liquid, the vapor would raise the temperature a little bit until it became a saturated liquid. And you can do that in a control process. Yeah. How is it changing state? Yeah, it's like a hot, um, like a steam coming from the turbine. It's steam coming from the turbine. And there's heat exchange as the, um, the cool water from the tower is going past it. Is there anything else happening in the condenser or is it purely a uh, heat exchanger? It's a good question. We would normally model it as an adiabatic heat exchanger yeah. because the preponderance of the heat will be lost. So you'll have coils running through here and you'll have... Uh, cold water and warm water. And whatever the, whatever the delta H between those two must be the delta H with a rate between those two. So those two H's must be the same. So whatever energy you thermal energy you remove from the steam to turn it into water must be thermal energy that you give to the cold water to make it become warm water. Yeah, that's where the energy is going. It's a good question, yeah. So is it essential to your like, ability to do work with the fluid? So why would you want to remove that? It's a good question. Why are we removing enthalpy? Because we have to, to get it back to the pump. Okay, so it's a practical concern. Yes, it's a practical concern, but it's also, it's, a, it's just a true reality of life. 
Like in order to create a cycle, you, and, they, and all of them do this, you compress basically, so the compressor or the auto cycle, you compress or add pressure, then you add heat, then you reduce your pressure back, and then you remove your heat in some way. For the auto cycle, we're exhausting and drawing in fresh air. For this, we're physically removing heat in a condenser. The heat's not useful. At that point, the heat's not useful. It's, the temperature's too low for us to do anything about it. Yeah, it's good. I'd prefer to have discussions like this than to get through the slides, just in case you don't know that about me. Um, so I really appreciate conversation. Good. Uh, what other assumptions would we make? Isentropic turbine and pump, if, unless you're told otherwise, and adiabatic except the boiler and condenser. So that would be a standard assumption that would make. Uh, that the only heat, places where heat is moved around, are the boiler and the condenser. This is what the process sounds like in words. We'll get through the process, we'll do the calculation. Not tomorrow. Tomorrow's Anzac Day. Don't come to uni. You'll be very lonely. Um, I'm just, I'm working out whether we're going to go to the dawn service. I would normally do a dawn service with an 18 month old. Vanessa said I can't leave both kids at home. <laughs> Fair enough. Sorry? Yes, probably. Yeah, if he gets up before dawn, I'm like, all right, son, in the car. Going down to Coogee Beach. All right. Process in words. So, we have a pump, which is ideally providing isentropic compression, and we can work out what it's going to do if it's not isentropic. We've got a boiler, isobaric, heat addition. We've got a turbine, isentropic expansion, condenser, isobaric heat injection. So these are four ideal processes in words. And this is the processes. Kellen, give me another five minutes. You might end up with a saturated mixture with a high quality, as we did before, or you might end up with a superheated uh, vapor at the end of your turbine. Right? If you've got this ideal versus actual case, you might end up with both of them being mixtures, one of them being mixed, the other being superheated vapor, or both being superheated vapors. Uh, you want to aim, probably, in a real design, something like this. So ideally, it would be a, a mixture, and actually, it's going to be a little, little bit superheated. Because all four processes are steady state, steady flow, open processes, we have a formula that we can use for those. Once we've taken out kinetic energy and potential energy, if we assume those are minimal. All right. And here are the four processes. Then, so this is trying to create an analogy between the, Bra the way we analyze the Brayton cycle and the way we analyze the Rankine cycle. We find that the work from the pump is a very small number, A, and B, because we're in the compressed liquid region, we don't find a lot of uh, resolution in the tables for compressed liquid. And so there's a different way to calculate the work for a pump, which isn't mentioned in Reisel, but comes through in Sengel and Bowles in his textbook, which is mass flow rate times the specific volume, and the specific volume changes through the pump, but not by much, like by a, point, a fraction of a percent. Um, what it does change significantly is the pressures. So the ideal work, the minimum amount of work you can put into compressing a substance through a pump is given by this formula in the bottom left-hand corner. I like it. I think it gives better resolution on the data. Um, because the pump power, the power you need to um, power the pump, is such a small fraction of the overall ranking cycle power, uh, it doesn't matter which one you use. Because you, if you're a couple of percent out there, it won't affect your overall thermal efficiency. But you should be aware of both formulas. And our efficiency is our work divided by our heat, which is one minus our heat out divided by heat in. So the lower we can get this number, the higher we can get this number, the more thermally efficient our cycle. So that's thermal efficiency. We won't look at the next lecture, but we will look at improved ranking cycle and say, well, how will we get our ranking cycle to be um, more efficient? This is a big deal and has been done extensively uh, because that matters. Like you want to burn as little coal as you can 
to get as much electricity as you can. High temperature is one of those things. Again, temperature limited by materials. Low, how low you can get the temperature depends on how low you can reject the temperature into your environment and, and is somewhat limited by low pressure because you create a vacuum in your condenser to get your temp low temperature down. We won't do that question. Are there any questions at this stage just based on that cursory analysis base of Rankine cycle? Excellent. Have a great week.